Hello everybody, welcome to Idajo Live. This time it is the seventh symphony of Gustav Mahler which we look at. Now Mahler is generally seen and understood and heard through his music as a personality who is tragic, usually darker and full of pain. And mo in most of his music, this is what we, uh, what we learn from his person, what he is, because he's a very honest composer and whatever he writes, it's clearly, it's coming out of his heart. And this time we have a symphony which is actually a lot of fun full of sense of humor and extremely optimistic. Now, how can we believe this? Can we actually believe it? Or can we um, see that, that a person who is generally dark and maybe even depressed, can he have fun? Do we, do we allow a person to to once try to, to compose an optimistic symphony. And it wasn't easy for Mahler. He finished the last one, the tragic sub, uh, sixth uh, symphony, which is obviously the most tragic music he has ever imagined and composed. And now I think it's a very natural move that for the next one, it should be upbeat. He started with the middle movements. The middle movements meaning that there are three um, movements in the center of this new work and of course he, he was already very professional by this time, by his seventh symphony. He knew that he would need a big huge first movement and a very big last one but he started with the middle ones. And these are probably the more accessible, easier movements to understand. So I would like to start now, not in the order of the movements, but how they were composed. The second and the fourth movement, he gave a title. He said, Nachtmusik. It's the music of the night, and in the middle of the two, there is a scherzo. Now, how does the first night, night music, how the, what kind of effect does it have on us? It starts with a one horn alone, like a roof, the Germans would say. It's a big call, call out in the night, in the darkness, and in fact an echo or a soft colleague or whoever answers the strong horn. And then always there is this soft answer and the strong and the, the, the soft horn somehow have a, have a dialogue with each other. Now remember it started. Um, what, where does it lead us? Out of this call, first we hear a few bird songs, and then what emerges is, is a typical lead style music. And like it could have a, it could have words. Actually the same notes. Um, feel it's like a soldier's song, like a something typically ambiguous. Mahler has a very strong relationship to military, military associations and it's always ambiguous because in the same time it has this soldier-like energetic feeling of duty and in the same time 
the feeling of absolute tragedy which might occur, of course, any time. And of course, the, 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 the horror of, of, of military life altogether. Now, how do we hear this? It's full of um, major and minor chords alternating, um, um, like um, this is the major. for you but when you listen to this second movement feel it like a song of a soldier with occasional tragedy and occasional positive uh, fun and duty it's actually very beautiful and scary in the same time now the real scare comes in the scherzo this is probably the most wonderful movement Mahler has ever composed. It is like a dance of ghosts. It starts already very strange. The timpani and the lower strings create these two notes. Now it somehow makes harmonic sense as he continues. up and up then finally these bass notes go to the bottom, bottom and now we find the tonality and then it out of it is a typical typical scherzo line li line um, takes off and leads us to a fantastic virtuoso incredible fast movement of I mean, ghosts dance around in this fantastic scherzo. But in fact, it has to do something with the night. It's a night vision. Next night music, you remember we had three middle movements, and now I, I, I got to the last one of the three. It's a group. This is one of the strangest movements I know of Gustav Mahler. He writes at the top only this one word, doesn't give us a hint, doesn't give us a story, but one word that it's amoroso, that it is a kind of love music. Now, in fact, it starts like that. It's a little bit misleading because you get this type of... Um, I mean, this has a little desire. Amoroso. We can say this is in love. So until here. Follows is something very childlike. Sort of almost we are back back in a in 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 a early age, and then the themes which. starts to rock, compose childlike music. Do you remember it was the same in the fourth symphony? But in the fourth symphony it was a childlike vision of paradise and heaven. And here I think what he attempts 
is childlike love. A love scene which in its intimacy it is actually I don't know how to phrase this easily. It's like two people who, who behave childishly together, but what they experience is mature love with each other. I have no idea how Mahler and his new wife at this time, Alma, how they behaved in, in an intimate situation. But this music makes me feel that they had a lot of childlike fun because Mahler adds strange instruments. Suddenly there are two fun instruments, a mandolin and a guitar who kind of play like, like tickling each other, like, um, I don't know, poking each other in a, the most childlike way I can imagine. And again and again the beautiful love feel of it comes back like this kind of lyrical music what we know of Gustav Mahler but what we don't know is like like this type of poking music what he writes in this movement it's, it's one of the, the most bizarre combinations of fun and love and some kind of discreet but hidden intimacy in this music. It's extremely enigmatic. Now, after the three movements, what he composed earlier, this was when in the same time when he actually finished the sixth symphony so I, I completely understand that after this tragic music he wanted to change into something very different he had to start to compose the two big ones actually also the middle one the scared so so the, the three main main movements were not written yet and it took him a lot of strength there are, there are letters uh, which, which um, tell us clearly that um, he struggled. He couldn't find it. He couldn't find what to compose. He didn't have the inspiration. And he said, well, actually, I missed the whole summer without composing um, something important. You know, summers were very important for Mahler. He had to work as a conductor in the, the Viennese opera during the season. He didn't have time. In the summer he had time and so there he is and no inspiration. He couldn't write anything. And then finally, somehow, after a, a sea voyage, there was some kind of a journey on a lake or on the, on the sea. He said, yes, I, I found something. And he started and then within a short period he could compose again. And this is, for me, personally, extremely interesting also as a, as a, because, you know, this is something composers understand more, I think, than performers. That why was this so difficult for Mahler? The way I interpret this question is that he wanted to compose purely symphonic music. In the past, he composed music which was a collection of various ideas. There was always something eclectic about Mahler. The first symphony, the second symphony, the third symphony is like a, an arsenal, like a collection of ideas um, which came to his mind and he so, so somehow organized them in a sublime way and, and it became his composition but this time he didn't do that maybe he wanted to dig a little deeper into himself and find a pure abstract music for the first and the last movement of this symphony now how how did he succeed 
The first movement is a very energetic, colorful movement, very long, and maybe it is not one of the most popular works by Mahler because it doesn't have a, a catchy sort of tune which, uh, which you can whistle and which you remember easily. It is motivic, polyphonic, it is wonderful to listen to because it's extremely rich, full of wealth, but it is not the collection of ideas as we are used to hear from him. Of course, again, like in, in the case of other symphonies, he found a very special way to start. I think his main idea was a rhythm. Bum! This must have been the very first idea. Then he had to find a harmony. Now what harmony? And he found a very unusual choice. This chord. This is not a tonic chord, it, it, it is not something which leads anywhere. This is the chord. And he simply repeats the rhythm. By the way, the next chord will be exactly the same, one step higher. in a kind of no one's land, a kind of um, meditative, uh, neither this direction nor that, nobody knows where does this chord lead to. And then comes the ingenious inspiration that on top of it he found a very unusual instrument which we know more from wind bands and we don't know it from the symphony orchestra, it's called a tenor horn. And the tenor horn plays a, with a big sound a melody on this chord. Now you remember the next harmony. So this symphony starts with this. Repeated and the horn. He comes in with this big sound like a huge beast would suddenly start to sing. Now this is the typical ingenious Mahler start of a symphony. But soon he gets to the main part of the movement which doesn't have an easy grasp but it's a wonderfully satisfying, fantastically composed music, which I highly suggest to listen more than once. Now let's jump to the end, to the last movement of this symphony. Here was the decision that Mahler wanted to write something extremely optimistic. And I think he has the right to be optimistic once in his life and once to have something really shiningly fun and happy. It is so naively optimistic, this uh, music, which is mainly just C major chords of like... <laughs> sound. Some people find it similar than the, the, to the Meisterzinger overture. You remember this kind of... Everybody knows this. The, um, the feel of it is in fact similar because both have a kind of naive optimism. Naive because the, the, the amateur Meisterzinger who, who um, are of course who have various professions but this time they make music so they are very happy and Mahler is 
extremely happy in, a, in the most naive way you can imagine. Of course, it, it, is, it has elements, this last movement, which have other type of naive, optimistic music. For example, there is one which I associate, um, what I hear in it is a little bit like the Hasidic Jewish um, happy niguns. You know, niguns are these songs people sing on the Shabbat uh, um, after the lunch. They go, hey, hey, bing, bang, bing, there is this certain um, Hasidic uh, happiness uh, or, or, or complete ecstatic joy, it pops up in the last movement. Another one is an Austrian element which again appears regularly. This This is the yodel technique as uh, the voice goes up suddenly in, in this high register and well, Mahler had a lot of Austrian, a lot of Jewish elements, but he picked the happiest musical motifs out of this folkloristic pool and combined it into an amazing mu movement because Mahler has never ever written anything as shiningly optimistic as this one. The result is a little fragmentic. It goes from one to the other one. Sometimes they don't seem to belong together. And especially near the end, if you listen carefully, like in the last five minutes of this symphony, it almost becomes crazy. And this is the moment where I, I must admit, in performances, I, I get a little scared that in this depressed person who has this optimistic music is somehow loses the control to reality. And then it, it becomes so fragmented and so strange that I think, oops, he lost, he lost something. I'm sorry, I have to let my dog in one second. Come in. Come, come. Yes, so there are these few minutes in this last movement which I'm a little worried about Mahler. But somehow I still think that even somebody who has difficulty being so happy, so intimately in love, so childishly in love, should be allowed to write once a completely optimistic symphony. And this is the seventh. Now let me see if you have questions which I can answer. I open my messages in my phone. Right. So I've got one here which says, was this the only time Mahler composed movements in a different order? Interesting question. Well, what is the usual order? The usual order Ma, uh, composers compose a symphony that is usually a first one, then a slow movement, then a dance movement, and a finale, a final one. This is like the, the basic rule. Uh, very soon, uh, uh, many composers, including Beethoven, changed the order and did something different, like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony has first the scherzo, then the slow movement many exceptions. Mahler has never been so regular. So, um, for example, the third symphony ends with the slow movement. The fourth symphony ends with a simple song. Um, and the, the sixth symphony, uh, this was the subject of last week, 
struggles because Mahler himself changed the order in one way or the other. He, he composed the scherzo first after the, the beginning movement, then, then he changed the order into first the andante, then the scherzo. If you refer to this, if you're asking me if he ever considered changing the order of this symphony, we don't have evidence of it and I don't think so. This, the structure and the balance works beautifully. It's like we have two pillars, the first and the last. The scherzo in the middle framed by the two Nacht music, night music. I don't think there is a it's possible to even consider a change of movements in this particular symphony. Now I don't have, I have one more question here. How do you call a chord like in the beginning of the first movement? This, this is very nice. I, I think it might come from a musician. Now, what is the chord? This is the harmony. Whatever note you put on top, it doesn't matter. This is the same harmony. It's, it's an inversion which has the third, third, third and then a second on, on the top. The original um, order of notes would be this seventh chord. If you, if you invert this, you have this. It's the same, you hear it, but it's, it feels very different with the B in the bass. This can be interpreted, of course, in different tonalities, in different way. For example, if we are in F sharp minor, I would say, and then if we would have this cadence, then it's one on the second step. We have a sevens. This is what we are talking about. Five. Invert this, and there we are. So it's an inverted minor seventh chord. Now, start your harmony lessons, please, next week. Well, please listen now to the Seventh Symphony. It's one of my favorite works. If you link here below, you can find the if you click here, you can find the link. And thank you very much for listening to me. This was Aidajo Live. I see you next time. Goodbye.